I'm James Turk. I'm a director of the Gold Money Foundation. It's my pleasure to be here with Chris Martinson. Chris, as you know, is the uh, founder of the popular website, chrismartinson.com. He's also the author of this wonderful book, The Crash Course. And I want to talk to you a little bit about this book, Chris, but let's first talk about markets. Um, I, I want to cover a variety of different things. And here we are in Madrid, Spain, so it's sort of natural to talk about the euro. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the problems are not being solved. Um, do you see any solutions in the future or do you see more problems? And uh, how do you see the euro unfolding in the weeks and months ahead? You know, uh, from a long time ago, I guess probably five or six years, I've been diagnosing uh, the predicament we're in uh, as something that can be summarized in three words, too much debt. We've been on this incredible credit bubble that's actually started decades ago, but, but even if we just looked at the credit bubble starting from the year 2000, to 2008, total credit market debt doubled. I mean, it just doubled. It was this incredible explosion of credit. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, that had to come to an end at, at some point. And so when I look at this, I don't see a problem, meaning we, we can apply some solutions and some policy tweaks, and maybe the ECB buys a few of these off-run bonds over here, or intervenes here, or does that. Yeah. We, we have a, we're facing a predicament, meaning there is no solution to this. Somebody's gonna have to take a, a huge loss on, on that credit. and. That's sort of the unfolding drama that I see us in right now is figuring out where are the losses, who's going to take them, because there's no way to continue the trajectory we were just on. The debts cannot be repaid. There's just not enough available wealth or resources or cash flow to repay all That's of the right. debts. Consequently, some of those debts are going to have to be written off. Mm -hmm. and banks are reluctant to write them off because that would make them bankrupt. Uh, they don't have enough capital to absorb those losses. And in this environment, they can't get more capital because nobody wants to put money into a bank mm -hmm. that's going to go insolvent anyway. So governments are trying to keep the game going by themselves putting these bad debts on their books. But as we saw in Greece and as we're seeing in Italy, um, in fact, as we're seeing in many places in Europe, the governments also have a limit as to how much debt they can absorb before they become insolvent. Well, that, that's exactly the dynamic we're in. And, and if you widened up your lens just a little bit, this was completely obvious. To me, it was anyway. And, and a number of people I know have, have saw this coming years in advance. And it's because it's a simple math problem. Mm -hmm. You can't forever increase your loans or your indebtedness faster than your income. I don't care if you're a person, a private individual, a family, a town, or a nation state. It doesn't matter. The dynamic is the same. Yeah. And we saw that uh, happening with the weaker states. It gets exposed first. But this is true of even the strongest states. Credit market debt was growing at six, seven, eight percent a year for decades, even as nominal economies were growing at four and five percent. And and so that's just a mathematical disaster. Sooner or later, all we were waiting was for perception to catch up with reality. And when it does, of course, things unfold very rapidly. You know, one year Greece is perfectly solvent and they're paying just a couple of you know hundred basis points over German debt. Next year, you know, they're completely insolvent and their two-year debt's going off at you know over a hundred percent. It's just when the perception shifts, of course, reality catches up very, very rapidly. Well, it doesn't even take years for perception to, sh to shift. Like uh, a few months ago, Italy was b borrowing money at 4%. Now the 10-year bonds this morning were 7.2% and poised to go higher still. Um, so, I mean, perceptions are changing, except maybe political perceptions are not. Have they accepted the reality of the situation, politicians? You know, I'm, I'm really puzzled by what's happening at the political level because one thing I trust politicians to do is to try and preserve their own jobs. You know, they, they want to be reelected, they want to stay in power. And the mysterious part of this is seeing time and time again, whether we're talking a German politician or, or, or um, politicians in Iceland or in Italy, they are all coming out and trying to present to their people very unpopular plans which basically say, hey, we want you, the people, to shoulder the losses for these things uh, so that the bankers don't have to, to eat the, the losses that they, they should naturally assume for having taken the risk. Why would politicians, this is puzzling to me, come out with things that are absolutely deeply unpopular so there's some enormous tension here between what the people want, what the bankers want, politicians caught in the middle. For now, it looks like the politicians have been leaning towards the banks. And, and that's been a puzzling dynamic to me. Are politicians caught in the middle or are they controlled by the bankers? Well, that, that would be another interpretation of all this. And of course, all through history, we find out the bailout has been the name of the game, that we want to privatize the profits when times are good, but when the losses come, we want to socialize those. And we either socialize them directly by taking those bad bets and putting them onto the public balance sheet, or we print. 
and thereby dilute all the holders of the currency and, and make everybody sort of shoulder it. And it just doesn't make sense and people are confused and politicians don't know what's going on and central bankers are, are wildly confused because here they are, you know, the central uh, Federal Reserve in the United States dumped in a trillion dollars and then another trillion and then they made loan guarantees and all kinds of things, you know, totaling in the tens of trillions. Mm -hmm. and. Ultimately, what happened? Well, we got a little bit of anemic growth, and, and where's our big, you know, resurgence in, in economic activity? Where's our next business cycle? You know, they're just crossing their fingers, hoping that the economic engine will cough back to life, and it hasn't been. And so this has got to be deeply confusing to these people who are just focused in that one E, the economy, yeah. because things aren't working the same. They're just not working like they used to. We should have been, uh, you know, we look at, you know, this is the most lackluster recovery from a recession that's ever been, you know, uh, recorded and, and all sorts of things aren't working right. And I think if we just widen our lens up just one more and we, we include energy into this story, we can discover that everything that's happening right now is perfectly understandable, perfectly predictable. And guess what? The old tricks aren't going to work like they used to because as you, you know, started very wisely at the beginning of this uh, interview, the resources aren't there to give us what, we, what we've come to know and expect, which is we pull some monetary levers and things roar back to life because all these input feedstocks, the energy, the raw resources are there for us in the quantities we need to continue on our merry way. And in a broad sense, too, the savings on which you could build debt. But we don't have those savings anymore, no, the no, accumulated no. capital. Right. The savings aren't there. The investment hasn't been there. You know, we've really um, gone way overboard into this financialization of the economy. You know, when my grandfather was a president of a bank back in the 40s and 50s, uh, banking profits were about 4% of the total economy. And we look at financial profits in 2007 peaked at 40% of the economy. That's way too much financialization. And that's what Bernanke et al. are trying to preserve is this really bloated financial structure. And they say, oh, no, we have to have it all. And they might be right because of how interlinked all those organizations are now. There's no such thing as a U.S. bank and a European bank. They're all threaded together. And we've got these derivatives, which they don't know how those are threaded together. And, and so they're so afraid of that. We saw that with the Greek. This was just, I thought, preposterous, right? So Greece enters default by every measure of the word that you could possibly imagine. But they come to this agreement that the credit default swaps won't be triggered in this example because it's a voluntary markdown, you know. Yeah. And, and so, but the reason they did that, I'm convinced, is they're scared to death. What happens if we trigger those CDS obligations? We don't know. We don't know who the counterparties are, literally. Mm -hmm. and, and whether those counterparties will be revealed to be insolvent and then one domino tips over and another goes over and they're afraid, I think, that the whole system is either supported or going to collapse. And I, it's that binary, I think, is the fear right now.